Well, it's an honor and a joy for me to be with you and to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ together with our Mother Mary. I'm happy to relate to you uh, the Cana miracle as it has happened and as it been created here in this Cana garden in front of the Spiritual Life Center. The first point to be made is why in the front of the Spiritual Life Center? It is here on this spot because we all come by way of the family. The family is the most important unit in the church and in society. And Mary and Jesus, together with a few of his disciples, were invited to a wedding feast. In the wedding feast at that time, the groom and the bride were prearranged by their parents. Then they had a 30-day betrothal time. And then they were married and the celebration went on from one to two weeks. There would be invited guests with hand-delivered invitations by servers and by servants. And the, but the whole village was invited and felt free to come. And in this instance related in the Bible, I don't know if the, they had more people show up than they expected or they had less wine than they needed. But in any event, they ran out of wine. And so Mary tells Jesus, they have no wine. Please let me point out that Jesus has his left, arm, left hand over his heart and Mary's hand is gently touching his. It's like a tender touch. And their eyes meet. And if you look into their eyes and look at the, the, the slight smile they have on their face, you can see the emotion that's taking place between them. Imagine what's happening in those few words. So she simply says, they have no wine. And this can be interpreted in several ways at several levels. The first level is that she's trying to save them from embarrassment, the wedding party. The second is she might even unknowingly, probably unknowingly, by the reason of the work of the Holy Spirit within her, is referring to the Israelites, the chosen people who have been without a prophet for 450 years. And they ask the, in, in scripture, how long is this going to go on? They were dried up, they were without wine, they were without spirit. And so Mary could have had them in mind. At least the Holy Spirit could have. But there's a third reason, and I think this is the reason. I think the movement in Mary's heart by the Holy Spirit, who was, was her spouse since the Annunciation, was moved to tell Jesus her son, and now becoming her savior, uh, to, they just have no wine. Uh, we've run out of spirit. And it is time for, the, the time has come for you to begin the journey toward Jerusalem. And Jesus responds to her, woman, how does that concern me? My hour has not yet come. And for the hour, it was always the hour of glorification. It embodied the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when he says the hour hasn't come, he said that a good number of times within scripture when they wanted to take him and kill him. And he always escaped from their midst because he said, my hour has not yet come. And then when it came, at the agony in the garden, after that horrible experience, he told the disciples, get up, let us go. My betrayer is at hand. The hour has come. And so his death and resurrection is the hour of glory. And what happened to him happens to each one of us in death. When death comes to us, it is our hour of glory. So she is confidently and uh, communicating to him what she is feeling in her Holy Spirit and letting it up to the Holy Spirit to move Jesus' heart. And when Jesus calls her woman instead of mother, it has a great significance. 
it harkens back to the original sin in Genesis into that garden. And uh, when after the original sin, the father said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. You shall touch right her heel, but her heel will crush your head. And then John uses the word woman in this circumstance. He doesn't use it again until Calvary, beneath the cross. And, and at the cross, he says, woman, behold your son to John. And to John, he says, behold your mother. And in that instance, Jesus gave Mary to all of us as our mother. She's the new Eve. He is the new Adam. This is something new that's happening, something very creative and lavish. Um, you notice a rock uh, beneath his arm, extended arm, and it's not just a rock to protect from somebody from running into his arm, it is that practical purpose. But an extended arm is a, is a sign of the power of God flowing through. When um, God led the Israelites, the chosen people, out of Egypt through the Red Sea into freedom, they came to the point when they had their backs to the sea and, and their, their fronts, they saw the chariots of the charioteers coming because Pharaoh had changed his mind. He was going to keep them in slavery. And Moses cried out to God and God said, extend your hand over the waters and part the waters so that they can cross on dry land. Jesus, the scriptures tell us that God himself with arm extended and powerful hand led the, the chosen people out of Israel, out of Egypt, out of their slavery. So this has a great significance. It also in all the sacraments except marriage, where the couple are marrying each other, conferring the sacrament on each other, the, the priest, the minister of the sacrament extends his hand showing that it is the power of God that is baptizing and confirming and ordaining and forgiving sins and confession. In every Eucharistic prayer, the priest puts out his hands like this and says some words varying from one Eucharistic prayer to another. God, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy so that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This rock, by the way, points right down the hall of the Spiritual Life Center to the rock in the Adoration Chapel on which rests the tabernacle, and in the tabernacle is contained the body and blood of Christ in the host. I want to move with you to the, uh, to the next scene in which Mary is going to tell, be telling Jesus, do whatever he tells you. Mary goes from Jesus amidst the people, and the people at the wedding don't know what's taking place. Uh, this is the second significant scene, and probably the most important. Was Mary, with confidence that the Lord will do what the Holy Spirit moves him to do, goes to the serv servants and says simply, do whatever he tells you. And Mary will always point us to Jesus and tell us, do whatever he tells you. And again, that carries us right through the Spiritual Life Center to the Adoration Chapel, to the Lord reserved in the Blessed Sacrament on the rock. And she is if pointing to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, go there and do whatever he tells you. To do that, we have to listen, be able to calm our inner life, to achieve some kind of inner silence. Um, in, in scripture it says, listen to the rock who saves us. And in the transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, there's a, the voice from a cloud comes and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So listening becomes a very important part of our journey through this miracle garden and through the journey of our life. And again, if you look at their eyes, their eyes speaking to each other, and Mary is especially, she's so beautiful. 
and she has such calm and peace and resignation in, in her eyes and in her face, in, in her just slight smile. Um, and that, that shows the inner peace that she possesses, the oneness of her will with that of the Father. And she's so resigned to whatever God is asking of her. But keep in mind, we go from uh, the first, they have no wine, to the servers and says, do whatever he tells you. There were six urns that were present at a wedding feast and they were filled with water and it was for ritual ceremonial purification. And Jesus told the servers, fill the jars with water. The water had been used over the period of time that people were gathering for the wedding day after day. And, and they filled the jars with water and only the servers knew where it came from. And the sculptor in this instance, Bill Hopin, starts with a very light and every, every, with every uh, jar it gets darker so that there's gradually a change in the water becoming wine. There's a new aroma that takes place. There's a transformation that takes place. And turning the water into wine signifies Christ transforming us into himself. Um, these jars, uh, six in number, are filled with the best wine, but only the servers know where it came from. And uh, let me take you now to the, to the conversation that takes place between the chief steward and the, the bridal couple. You'll notice that the, the chief steward uh, has already tasted the wine and his face is just so satisfied. And he says to the bridal couple, couple uh, you know, um, people usually serve the poorer wine uh, last and the best wine first so that after they have had their drinking of, uh, enough, then they serve the, the poor wine and the people don't notice the difference. But you've kept the best wine to last. And the, the, the best wine to last is a metaphor of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was kept to last. And that's a very important point. In St. John, in a later chapter after this first sign of Jesus, this first miracle of Jesus, the first time he manifested his glory, says Jesus was given a homily, giving a sermon, giving a great talk, and he raised his voice and he said, Is anyone thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. And from within him will flow fountains of life-giving water. And then John adds in parentheses, he was here speaking of the Holy Spirit who would be given to those who believe in him. The water become wine, the wine become the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ become the Eucharist. And, and so there's a great flow here that is so much of symbolism and, and deserves so much of meditation. It builds into the multiplication of the loaves when the disciples said, send the people home because they're hungry, just like they're being thirsty. And Jesus said, well, give them something to eat. He said, we only have a few fish and a few loaves here. How, what's that among so many? And he said, get them to set in small groups and distribute the food. And he distributed the food and it multiplied. And afterwards, there were 12 baskets full left over. And it's the same with this transforming of water into wine. There's a plenitude, it shows a munificence, it shows the, 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 just the uh, lavishness of God to us. It represents his enormous love for us, even to the cross, even to that hour of glory that he holds out to all of us. So the new wine, the best wine, is the Holy Spirit and it's poured out when he breathes his last on, on the cross and is poured out on the Pente at Pentecost, on the disciples and on um, our Blessed Mother. And it's poured out on each of us in baptism, where John the Baptist had promised and said, I baptize you with water and repentance. There's one coming after me who will, bap you, who will baptize you with water and the, and the Spirit. 
In another, it's with water and the fire. And so the couple, having, having now tasted the wine, know that there's a difference. But there's a difference in their lives. They have been married. They're now husband and wife. They're now one. Um, they, they're leaving their family behind. They're going to live their own life. And so we in this Cana miracle are, are meant to change our lives. And it's a daily t kind of living, just like it's a daily living for a married couple and any person. We're always being more and more transformed in, into uh, Jesus Christ. In one translation, St. Paul says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed into Jesus Christ. And that's the significance of this whole miracle is that it means for us to be transformed into something new. We don't put new wine in old wineskins, as Jesus said. Otherwise, it'll break. So that's the, that's the challenge for us, to go to Mary, do what Jesus tells us, listen, and then respond, and be confident of the Holy Spirit's power in our life, the Holy Spirit's guidance in our life, the Holy Spirit's reminding in our life to do that which is right. Um, so again, it's been a pleasure to be with you. I hope you have an opportunity to meditate on these three settings. And then as you come and go in the Spiritual Life Center, you'll notice at the door, there's a, a piece that was added that is not in the story. And I want to talk to you just a moment about that. At the door here to the Spiritual Life Center, you notice this young, young boy, a young man, and as you come towards the entrance to the Spiritual Life Center, he's, he holds out to you a glass, a goblet of this best wine. And he has an, such an expression on his face. Uh, and his eyes are so penetrating and they're so filled with love. And it's like holding it out and saying from Scripture, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. That's the passage. Bill Hope and the sculpture added this on his own and we loved it and we took it to heart and so it became a part of the whole scene of this Cana garden. Um, by the way, the, the committee worked hard on this under Monsignor Hamburger's uh, chairmanship and they deserve a lot of credit and we can't ever thank them and, and Bill Hope and for being such a worthy, worthy, being such worthy instruments of the Holy Spirit. So thank you again. God bless you.